I would invite you to turn in your Old Testament scriptures to Genesis chapter 3. We'll be reading just a portion of this familiar passage. We'll look at some of the details in the message. Genesis chapter 3 and verses 1 through 8. If you are able to stand, I would invite you to do so now for the reading of God's word. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Our New Testament reading, Romans chapter 5 and verses 12 through 17. Romans chapter 5 will begin with verse 12. And read through verse 17. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came to the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. We continue in our series looking at the Westminster Confession of Faith. Here now chapter 6, which deals with the fall of man, and we'll deal approximately with the first half of what the confession says on this subject. Now what have we already considered thus far in our brief series, we began by looking at the doctrine of Scripture. And we saw that significantly, the Westminster Confession of Faith begins with the Word of God, not because we worship our Bibles, but rather because it is the foundation of all that we know about God and man. It is the foundation for what we know about redemption, and so that is the starting point of the Westminster Second, the confession then focuses on God and his triune nature, the essential doctrine that we confess as a church, the triune nature of God. The third chapter deals with God's decree, God's eternal plan 
for all things, and the next two chapters then show how God's decree is fulfilled. It is fulfilled in his work of creation and his work of providence. And we observed how there is significant overlap in the doctrines of God's decree and the doctrine of God's providence. Because as we study both of those doctrines, you come across the question of how does evil fit in with God's plan? How does evil fit in with God's rule over his creation? And we observe from Scripture clearly that God is not to be blamed for sin. God is not the author of sin. And yet in God's wisdom, even sinful actions of men and women are used as part of his eternal purpose. Chapter 6, now our focus this morning, deals with the fall, man's rebellion, the consequences for man's rebellion. The next chapter of the confession deals with God's covenant, and we can see how both chapters 6 and 7, the fall and God's covenant, prepare the way for section 8 of the confession, which deals with the Lord Jesus Christ, our mediator. So that's where we have been and where we are moving Now, we look at Genesis 3 again this morning, and this is such a familiar story, very, very familiar. We might say it's so familiar that we can lose the horror of the subject. Now, the goal for this morning is not that you will leave this service in tears or that you will leave this service shrieking, crying out, but may the Lord indeed impress upon us the horror of sin, the horror of sin, the horror of rebellion, but then also the glory of his grace. Most of our focus will be on the horror of sin. And rightfully we focus on that, but let us never forget the glory of his grace. The horror of Adam's sin, the horror of your sin, the triumph and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That will be our focus. Let's look at Genesis 3, and maybe you've even seen a movie of the book of Genesis, and I'm sure all of us have been disappointed at some time watching some movie about a biblical story. Why can't Hollywood, why can't even other Christian producers produce a good film? Well, one of the reasons is that biblical narratives are not screenplays. Biblical narratives are are very brief. They're to the point. They're meant to be read out loud. They're not meant to be used as scripts for screenplays. They don't focus on secondary matters. Indeed, every word in the text is important. And so the the focus of Scripture is that which is theologically important, not background details, not character development and the like, not the things that make for good movies. And so the Word of God, every word important, And yet we observe sometimes there is very little background material. Indeed, we go from Genesis 2, this glorious chapter about the perfection and the beauty of creation, and then instantly we are dealing now with the attack of Satan and the temptation of Satan against Adam and Eve. Now, we should note, and we've done this before, a very important wordplay that you see at the end of chapter 2 and the start of chapter 3. You look at the last verse of chapter 2. They were both naked, the man and his wife. And the word naked is very similar in sound to the word used to describe the serpent. He is described as cunning. In fact, in a Hebrew dictionary, the words naked and cunning appear right after each other. The one word arom, the other word arum. So there's definitely a play On words. Adam and Eve are created perfect. They are naked without shame. But now we have a cunning, deceptive serpent. Obviously, we know this is the work of Satan. Now, as we read the text, we're again introduced to a serpent that can speak, and nothing is stated about that. It surprises us, but we're not given again any background information. Now, we do know from John chapter 8. And we know, I think, even from the text itself, this is more than just a talking serpent. How do we know that from the text? I think in part we see that based on the judgment on the serpent. And of course, the prophecy of our Lord in verse 15 indicates this is more than just dealing with an ordinary snake. But as Jesus said, the devil is the father of lies. 
And certainly, Jesus is talking about Genesis 3. Now, the confession states the fall was part of God's plan, that he permitted it, having purposed it according to his own glory, purposed to order it according to his own glory. Now, do we see that in Genesis 3? Well, I would say in part. We see that in that God introduces again his glorious plan of redemption. But other passages of Scripture help us understand that even the fall itself is part of God's plan. We've used Ephesians 1.11 a number of times. Ephesians 1.11 that says that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. That certainly must include Genesis chapter 3. Now, if you're looking for the answer to why God had this as part of his plan, that's not been revealed to us. It's not that we never ask questions, but clearly your focus needs to be on what has been revealed. That's what is most important. Focus on what God has revealed rather than try to speculate on that which has not been revealed. Now, again, if you give attention to Genesis 3, what does this chapter emphasize? What stands out as it gives the account of the fall? Well, as we've already seen, the first thing that comes into focus is the cunning nature of the serpent. The cunning nature of the serpent. And then we ask the question, what is Satan's strategy? Well, it's pretty clear here. Satan's strategy is to question, indeed to dismiss, God's truth. You notice that when you read this text, the serpent never directly tells Eve or Adam, eat the fruit. Do you see that? He doesn't tell them, Adam or Eve, eat the forbidden fruit. Rather, what does Satan do? He deceives Eve into thinking there won't be any consequences if you eat the fruit. In fact, He deceives Eve into thinking God is unreasonable. God is unfair keeping you from this single tree. It's also worth observing the serpent, Satan, only speaks two times. He only speaks two times in this text. It's not a long, detailed conversation, is it? Satan worked through deception And he worked through the encouragement that they would question God. That they would think that the consequences for disobeying God would actually be for their good. Doing what he said not to do would actually be beneficial to them. Now we know this text is historical. We don't turn it into a myth, certainly. We know it's, this is historically, it's a summary, of course, of what has happened, and yet I think we are able to see from this the basic strategy of temptation. The nature of temptation is this. Whether it's Satan directly behind it or just your own fallen nature, it's to think what? The consequences of sin will not be very serious. You may not even feel them. Maybe it it will be even for your good. The lie of sin is you will be happier doing what you want to do than what God tells you to do. That the consequences will not be be very serious. And you know, children, you're often tempted to think that what your parents ask you to do is not fair. That what God is encouraging you to do doesn't make sense. Maybe in light of what your other friends are able to do, there are the freedoms that they are given. Again, part of the lie of sin is what God is asking us to do, telling us to do, is not fair. We should have our own freedom. We also observe how Eve and Adam respond to the threat of Satan not very well. Look at verse 6. Such a beautifully written verse. Here's the response of, of the woman. The woman saw that the tree was good for food. Again, God has given them every tree of the garden. But she sees this tree also is good for food. The tree was pleasant to the eyes, but again, God has created an entirely beautiful garden. It was desirable for obtaining wisdom. Well, God has given them another way for them to gain wisdom. She took of its fruit and ate, 
she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. We've noted this before, but I think strong evidence, isn't it, that Adam is is right with Eve this whole time. Adam's not weed-whacking somewhere else in the garden. He is right there with Eve, watching what is going to happen, not in any way standing against the serpent, but just, we might say, being passive, and even more than passive, active in the rebellion. Now let's pause again for a moment just to try to picture this whole scene, the horror of man's rebellion, the horror of sin, and that God created them as perfect and holy creatures. Just a few verses earlier, they are naked, they are not ashamed. They are created perfect and holy. They're placed in what you could say is the most beautiful place you could ever imagine. I think we're right in saying the Garden of Eden that God built, that God designed, the most beautiful place ever on earth. It's not like they're restricted either. All the trees of the garden they can freely eat. There's just one tree. And they're told, don't eat from this single tree. You can eat from the tree of life. You can eat from every other tree. Genesis 3 then indeed helps us see how utterly foolish and stupid is sin. Rebellion against God. And you're to say that about Adam's sin, Eve's sin, but also your own sin. Indeed, we also again see the evil of Satan, the nature of temptation, and yet we are also able to say that God, in his infinite wisdom, was pleased indeed to use this, permit the fall, having purposed to order it for his own glory. And that is the glorious message of Scripture from this point onward. Well, second, let's consider the consequences again of sin. Let's look at our text, verses 7 and 8. Verses 7 and 8 record at least some of the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin. They wanted to be wise. They wanted forbidden knowledge, and they got what they wanted, but not as expected. Their eyes, we read, were opened. But was this a blessing? Not at all. They knew now they were naked, that they needed to cover themselves. And verse 8, I think, presents the worst of the judgments, in that they needed to now try to run and hide from the presence of the Lord. Now, in, perhaps in your translation, verse 8 is the beginning of a new paragraph, But I think it is best to see that verse 8 should be joined with verses 6 and 7 because verse 8 shows indeed the full extent of Adam and Eve's rebellion against the Lord. Now one of the questions we might love to know is how long did Adam and Eve live in the garden before they fell into sin? You know, that detail is never given in Scripture. We go right from the creation to the fall. We're not really able to say Now, verse 8 has been used by some to suggest that regularly Adam and Eve enjoyed this time of fellowship with God. I'm not sure if we can say that just based on verse 8. We do know that before the fall, Adam and the Lord directly conversed with each other. Adam didn't have to hide from the mighty presence of God. He received direct communication, direct instruction. But now in verse 8, Adam and Eve hear the voice or translated sometimes as sound. It's the word voice. They hear the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And I've commented before on this chapter. This is a description of a day of the Lord. And so the phrase, cool of the day, maybe should be better translated, the wind of the storm. Rather than thinking this is God coming for a late afternoon stroll. No, the picture is of God coming in a windstorm, coming now to confront Adam and Eve. That, I think, explains especially why they run from the presence of the Lord. They know they are sinners and they deserve judgment. They try to run. Again, look at the end of verse 8. They try to hide themselves from the presence of 
of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. What a pathetic picture, again, of man's attempt to hide and cover himself. Who could ever hide from God who has created all things? And yet, do we not find ourselves trying to hide things, try to cover things over ourselves? Certainly, we do that before men, but we can even foolishly attempt to think we can hide something from the Lord. So just as Adam and Eve, in their foolishness, tried to hide, so man, in his rebellion, thinks he can hide and run and cover. And so again, part of the gospel message of this text is you cannot cover your own sin. You cannot hide from God's judgment. It must be poured out on another. It must, you must be covered by the Lord himself. Now, we've already talked then about the consequences in part of Adam and Eve's sin. The confession lists three main consequences. First, they fell from their original righteousness. They fell from their communion with God. Second, they became spiritually dead in sin. Genesis 2.17 declares, For in the day that you eat of it, the forbidden fruit from the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil, you shall surely die. And we understand that refers to physical death that eventually came, but it also refers to spiritual death. Spiritually, they became dead. Paul in Ephesians 2.1 says, He and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Jesus said, one must be born again, born from above such that he can see the kingdom of God. And then third, Adam and Eve became totally depraved or wholly depraved in all parts and faculties of the soul and body. Now, this is the doctrine that in the Reformed faith is often called total depravity. And I know there is much misunderstanding of what this doctrine means. Total depravity means this. Sin affects every aspect of man's being and cuts off a sinner then from God and his grace. It is the total effect of sin on the mind, on the will, the conscience, the emotions, indeed the body itself. Sin affects every aspect of man's body. The doctrine of total depravity does not mean every person is as wicked as possibly he or she could be. G.I. Williamson, in his commentary, gives a good illustration. He says, take a, a glass of water, put some poison in that water, and stir it around. Now, is there any part of that glass of water that does not have poison, even if it's just a little bit? You say, no, poison has totally affected that glass of water. You couldn't just reach down to the bottom or somewhere in the middle and, and get some pure water. No, sin is like that. It spreads to every aspect Now, going back to that glass of water, you could put more poison in it. You could put more and more teaspoons or grams of poison in that glass. You could make it more poisonous, and such it is with men and women. Not all men and women are as evil as they could be. Some are growing to that degree. And so the doctrine of total depravity, very important. Sin affects every part of who we are. A newborn child, cute and cuddly, enters the world totally depraved. A person who does wonderful things, builds houses for the homeless, runs soup kitchens, that person, if they are not in right relationship with Jesus Christ, they are totally depraved. Again, it's an important doctrine because many people believe either in natural human goodness Or they don't realize the effect of sin on the thinking and the mind. They think that somehow people are neutral when they look at the world. No, people are not neutral. They are set against the things of God, even though they may be nice people. You you may know unbelievers that are very nice people. That fits in with the doctrine of total depravity. Because at their heart, they are in rebellion still against God. They will not accept the things of God as it regards the ultimate nature of reality. That is the doctrine of total 
depravity. And that is the glorious message again of redemption. That where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Well, third, let's consider the effects then of Adam and Eve's sin on all mankind. We have talked before about the serious problem that you face if you try to reconcile somehow the clear truth of God's word with the supposed teachings today about science. The supposed teaching of science is we do not have a single human ancestor, but rather at some point thousands, millions of years ago, there were hundreds or thousands of human ancestors that somehow have given birth to all of humanity. And so sadly, pathetically, I don't understand it. There are even supposed Christian professors and others who say, well, we can't really believe any longer in a historical Adam. Because you see, science tells us through genetics that there can't just be a single Adam and Eve. There must have been some larger pool that humanity comes from. And so sadly, those who want the approval of the world say, well, we have to reinterpret the Bible. Adam will say is just a figure of speech. Well, what's the danger in doing that? There are many. But let me ask two questions. First of all, who determines what is real and mythical in Scripture? And where does that end? Maybe Moses really didn't exist. He's, again, just another figure of speech. And you can go on and on in Scripture. Maybe no one ever really existed. It's just all myth. Secondly, is the Lord Jesus Christ real? Or is he, again, just another mythical figure? So those who give in and say, well, maybe Adam isn't real, that, my friends, is a dangerous, dangerous ground to give up. Because we know very clearly what the Bible says about Adam and about the Lord Jesus Christ as our covenant heads, as our representatives. We know very clearly what God's word teaches about how the guilt of Adam has gone and affected all of mankind. And when Adam is reduced to myth, what does that do to the message of the gospel? I think it is very a very dangerous attack on it. And so clearly we know from Scripture the corrupted, depraved nature of Adam and Eve is not just their own. It has been passed on. Again, every child enters the world totally depraved. One of the clearest passages of this is Psalm 51 and verse 5. Psalm 51, 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin My mother conceived me. Robert Alter, a brilliant scholar but an unbeliever, cannot understand this passage. He has to say, well, David somehow thinks even his mother was sinful when he was born. He's missing the deep theological truth that all men stand under the guilt of Adam. Indeed, they stand under their own guilt for their own sins. Again, to understand this, we have to know how Scripture speaks of covenantal headship or covenantal representation. Many people don't like the doctrine, but it's part of how God rules his world. He rules his world in terms of covenant and covenant headship. Probably many people would say it's not fair that what Adam and Eve did in the garden over 6,000 years ago affects me today. How is that fair that Adam's sin becomes part of my guilt and judgment? Well, that is the truth of Scripture. And we also remind those who say that you're not judged just for Adam's sin, but what about your own sin? But also then consider this. Is it fair that Jesus Christ should stand in the place of others. Is that fair that the sin of Christ, or excuse me, that our sin was placed on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? So very clearly as we turn to the New Testament, we have two passages showing the doctrine of covenantal headship and representation. We've already read one of them, at least in part. If you would turn again to Romans chapter 5. Good to be familiar with this doctrine. And Romans chapter 5, 
We'll just look again at verses 12 through 14. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world. Just stop there. Do we want to give up an historical Adam? After, especially after we read this text. One man, sin entered the world. And death through sin. Do we want to also, again going back to Genesis, do we want to say there were millions of years of death before Adam sinned? Again, based on the clear teaching of Scripture. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Adam then is a real historical figure. Adam is also then a type, a picture of the one who is to come, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul then in 1 Corinthians 15, if you want to turn next to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the glorious chapter of resurrection, but also Paul again describes covenantal headship and representation in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's look at verses 21 and 22 first. For since by man came death, By man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And then verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. John Calvin, in his commentary on Genesis 3, quoted the words of Augustine. Augustine said this, O wretched free will, which while yet entire, had so little stability. We'll later deal with the nature of free will. Adam and Eve had perfect free will. And yet, as Augustine said, O wretched free will. So little stability in that. Calvin also quoted the words of Bernard, saying this, Since we read that a fall so dreadful took place in paradise, what shall we do on the dunghill? Now, as we consider the nature of sin and the struggle against sin, we realize the unbeliever has no struggle against sin. If you're not a believer, there is no battle against sin. You don't really care. Maybe you want to improve your life. Maybe you want to get better at things. But there's no struggle, no battle truly against sin. That only exists for the believer. Only the believer perceives still the remnant of sin, the power of sin. And only the believer then knows the grace of God to fight against sin to truly struggle against it. And so part of that battle is to know the horror of sin, that we would never downplay, laugh at, or underestimate the power of sin and its consequences, to know that in ourselves we have no power to fight against it. We have no ability to cover or hide ourselves. It is all the power of God. The power of God in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The working of the Holy Spirit. Listen in closing to Romans 6. Romans 6, 9 through 11. A beautiful passage. Let me read this passage in closing. Romans 6, starting with verse 9. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Of course, we say amen to that. Then listen 
to the application. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. You say, how is that possible when I know I am still a sinner? And yet scripture says, reckon, account yourselves to be dead to sin. In that this, the power, the full stranglehold that sin has against you has been conquered. It has been broken. The curse, the judgment that you should receive from your sin has been paid. And so you are told in application, account yourselves dead indeed to sin. You have to know that and believe that according to the truth of God's word. That's the only where or the only place where you're going to get this perspective. Not looking into yourselves. No, it comes from knowing the truth of God's word. Account yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. My friend, never forget the horror the consequences of sin, but then even more, know the glorious gospel, reckoning yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. And you do this in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a Savior we have. Hallelujah. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, thank you for these familiar passages, passages we've heard 10, 20, even more times in our lives and will continue to hear. But more and more, may your truth dictate and guide our lives. Indeed, so that we never forget the horror of sin, but the glory of a Savior who has paid it all. And so indeed, help all in this congregation who know you in a saving way Indeed, help us then to account ourselves dead to sin, but alive to God and all through Jesus Christ, our Lord. May you receive all the glory and praise, indeed, even as you work out this passage in our lives, bringing this to our attention this coming week and in coming years. We pray this in the glorious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.